have Professor Rafael Yuste as our guest speaker today. Uh, Rafael Yuste is a professor of biological science, sciences and neurosciences at Columbia, Columbia University. He was born and raised in Madrid, Spain, where he obtained his MD at the University of at the Universidad Autónoma, which is here. Uh, she was, uh, after that, she spent some time at uh, Cambridge in the UK with a uh, group of Sidney Brenner. And then he did his PhD with Laurie Katz at the Rockefeller University in New York. She then moved to Bell Labs and uh, worked with David Stank and Winfried Beck. And in 1996, he joined the Department of Biological Sciences at Columbia University. In 2005, he became an uh, Howard Hughes Medical Institute uh, investigator and co-director of the Cavi Institute for Brain Circuits at Columbia. And since then, he's still working there and he obtained, obtained many awards for his work, uh, including the New York City Mayor, Majors and Society of Neurosciences Young Investigation Award. So, welcome to the Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you. You're so wonderful that uh, applauding me before I speak. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I'm up to the to your applause. So, it's, uh, I'm delighted to be here finally, um, and I spent the whole day talking a great science with uh, some of you, uh, and um, I wanted to uh, talk about uh, how the types of technologies that some of you are in this type of group as a whole is developing could matter crucially to answer fundamental questions in neuroscience, okay? So I'm going to try to present to you what are the big questions in neuroscience, the way I look at it, and how, and then sh show you the types of, of technical challenges that we have and how we are trying to solve them in New York in my lab, but that hopefully will may resonate very well with many of you that are working in at the interface between uh, biology, chemistry, and physics, and engineering. No? So uh, I would say that understanding the cerebral cortex is the biggest challenge in science of our times. And some people may not agree with, with this, but let me tell you why I say this. So um, the cortex is the largest part of our brain. Okay, and it, cortex means bark, the cerebral cortex, uh, and it's a little bit of this bark that covers our encephalon. Um, and this uh, bark is responsible for all our cognitive abilities. And we know this for sure, both from uh, human case lesions and animal work. No? So, in fact, you could argue that what makes us humans, human, what the humanity in our, in our, in our psychology is all due to the cortex. So, um, so it's fundamentally important for humans to understand the cortex because we will understand ourselves for the first time. Okay, and it's the only part of the, the, of the body that is not understood. I can tell you that in general, other parts of the body, medicine knows them well enough to be able to cure diseases. And when you go up from the nose, I mean, these psychiatric diseases, it's just hopeless. No? And we don't have, it's like trying to fix a car without understanding how it works. It's as simple as that. So why is it so difficult? Why people have been looking at, at the cortex now for 100 years, have been studying for 100 years, why haven't we figured this out? So, um, so everyone says it's because it's very complicated. There's built out of many cells, and these are examples of some of the layers in the cortex. From the top to the bottom, it's about two millimeters but this is very similar whether it's in humans or in mice. It appears very late in evolution in the mammalian lineage, and once it appears, it actually increases in size very quickly. So um, because of that, people have thought, have, are hypothes have hypothesizing that the way the cortex is evolved is by repetition of the same um, circuit that is a single modular unit that's getting duplicated in evolution very quickly. And this is in, in, uh, in this, this thought, this hypothesis is inspired by the way the rest of the body is put together in evolution, that we're metameric uh, animals and gene duplication is essentially the trick that evolution uses over and over again to grow bodies. 
So the, it is possible that the brain of a mouse, the cortex of a mouse, is built with the same basic module as the cortex of a human. The reason we're sort of smarter than mice is because we have more modules, but that the module is the same. And this is based on evolutionary arguments. It's also based on the development. The way the cortex develops in on ontogeny is stereotypical, in, and it's the same whether it's in a mouse, in a cat, in a monkey, or in a human. It's exactly the same. It's quickly through the same stages of, uh, of steps. Eh? Uh, but there's something uh, also quite deeply uh, fundamental about the idea that the cortex could be modular. And that is that if you look at different parts of the cortex, we know that they're involved in completely different computations. For instance, our visual cortex in the occipital lobe is involved with visual recognition. It's doing a very sophisticated visual analysis of the world. Meanwhile, the front of the cortex is involved with motor planning or thinking ahead about the future, calculating probabilities of things that will happen in the future. And then you look at the auditory cortex is involved in analyzing sounds, spectra. So if you, if you buy the idea that we're dealing with a modular structure, and if you think that all these different computations are so different, that means that if they're done by the same hardware, the common denominator has to be very simple. Okay? So you have all these different computations that mathematically have apparently nothing in common. If they're performed by the same hardware, this hardware, by definition, has to be simple, okay? So this is uh, why I'm so excited about trying to understand the cortex now in, in, in science, because I would argue that it, we're not dealing with a complicated structure, it's the opposite, it has to be very simple, because otherwise you wouldn't be able to do all these things. So I would venture the idea to you that we're dealing with something like the double helix, that we're looking for the brain's double helix, just like in genetics, they had all this data, people said genetics was very complicated and difficult, and then Watson and Crick came out with the double helix model, and bingo. It was as simple as pi, and it explained essentially everything. It's possible that this cortical module could be like a brain's double helix. It could be a simple algorithm that you could write down in a piece of paper and would be a fundamental computational power. It would be analogous a biological Turing machine, an algorithm that can be used to compute any optimization problem or any problem. So this is what we're looking for. Okay, no one has found this yet, uh, but I hope that within our lifetimes we'll see this happen. Someone will show up with the brain's double helix. Uh, and uh, why haven't people found this yet? So the cortex is complicated in the sense that it's, not, that it's built with many different cell types. And this is an example of different types of neurons that are present in the mammalian cortex. And again, it doesn't matter whether they're neurons from the mouse or the human, they look exactly the same. These are the layers that I was showing you earlier. This is the top of the cortex layer one, the bottom layer six. Again, this is about a millimeter and a half or so. And these are some of the cell types found in cats or in mice. And neurons come in different shapes. Uh, in fact, we still don't know how many classes of neurons are there in the cortex. It's possible that it's about a hundred different subtypes of neurons. And people have assumed that each type of neuron may have a different function, and that's why they look so different. They have different dendrites, which are in, uh, in blue here, or in black here, uh, and axons, which are in, in gray or in, in red. And these difference in morphologies are indicative that maybe they could be a different in, in function. So unfortunately, in these drawings, these neurons are separated side by side but in reality, they're all mixed in, next to each other. So um, this is a picture of the cortex of a mouse. This is a living brain slide, uh, and every one of these white dots is the cell body of one of these neurons that I was showing you earlier, okay? So the little cell body here could be one of these guys. But every one of these neurons has a tree as big and as complicated as these trees. So they're all mixed in. So that's why people have been afraid and have always assumed that we're never going to understand this. In fact, uh, the, uh, the first investigator who really made a headway in the cortex was someone called Ramon y Cajal, who was Spanish. A hundred years ago, he wrote a book in which he argued to young investigators that they should never work in the cortex <laughs> because he, he said these are the impenetrable jungles where many investigators have lost 
lost themselves. He was talking about himself because he worked in the cortex his whole life and could never figure it out. So in a picture like this, we could be looking at these impenetrable jungles, but maybe of a universal computer. Okay, this could be one of these modules. Maybe there are several modules up here in front of our eyes. We just don't know how to decipher that, that information, but it's present there. Okay, so this is the challenge. And uh, what we need to do to the cortex is the same research program that engineers, electric engineers do in a, in a day-to-day -day basis, which is to reverse engineer it and turn pictures like this into circuit diagrams like that. Okay. Um, and our group and many groups around the world are trying to do this reverse engineering job. And um, what we need to do is to be able to first image the activity or record the activity of all the cells. Okay. This is the first technical challenge. We have to be able to image that that activity. The second thing we need to do is to turn cells on or to turn them off. Okay. If we could do this, then we could actually reverse engineer because we'd be able to essentially poke the circuit. Uh, and then the last thing is what we call to play the piano, which is to simultaneously manipulate the activity of all the neurons in arbitrary spatial temporal pattern. Because if we could do this, we may be able to figure out the transfer function. If you were an electrical engineer, you have a circuit like this, and you can actually play the piano with the circuit and start putting any arbitrary functions, you can figure out the transfer function. Okay? So this is, the, uh, this is the dream. So obviously we need new methods. And this is a nice quote from Crick, who, uh, like Caja, uh, is after figuring out DNA, he spent the rest of his life trying to figure out the cortex, and he failed, like Caja. But he was arguing in this uh, quote that we need better techniques, that we're dealing with a technical bottleneck. And he imagined a method in which you could inject uh, neurons with a substance and label all the cells that are connected to it. So this would be a method that would give you the circuit diagram of the cortex. Um, people are trying to do this now in neuroscience. There's a big revolution of methods getting invented left and right and developed. Some of them are using electron microscopy, and this is what you may have heard as connectomics. There was actually a nice review in Science last week on connectomics from Lichman. Another approach is using electrophysiological methods, pair recordings recorded at, at the same time from pairs of cells to find out if they're connected. This would be equivalent to the electrical engineer going in with a voltmeter and poking systematically every two positions in the circuit to see whether they're connected or not. There are genetics methods that try to label the circuits using genetic tricks, using retrovirus, viral methods to uh, label the circuit. And um, we think that uh, we're pushing for the optical methods, that using light, you could actually carry out this research program and make uh, Crick happy. Okay. So, um, but because all these cell types are all mixed, if you want to go in with optics, to reverse engineer the circuit, you need to have the same precision, at least that the circuit has. Okay, and that's why um, I think we need single cell precision. That you're not going to be able to reverse engineer the circuit with optics if you're stimulating or f many groups of cells. You need to go one cell one at a time. The solution for that in our hands is to use two photon excitation, because it's a technique that enables you to uh, use. Uh, laser light uh, with optical sectional properties to go deep into scattering media and has a, a spatial resolution effectively of much smaller than the size of a neuron. So with two photons we can image and we can optically manipulate and play the piano with this single cell precision that we need to do this reverse engineering job. So uh, I'm going to describe a series of techniques that we've developed using two photon lasers to try to go through this research program. I will not tell you what is the answer of the brain double helix, but I will tell you how people like me and other groups were trying to get there and how some of the work that's getting done in this campus could matter. So let's talk first about imaging. So the idea again with a two photon image is to be able to capture the spatial structure of the circuit and read out the temporal dynamics, the uh, activity patterns. Um, and this is something that started 
through a chance discovery that I made when I was with CAT, that you could use calcium as a proxy for the electrical activity of a cell. Okay, so why does that happen? So this is a, an experiment in which we're imaging calcium in a neuron that we've patched with an electrode and we fill the cell with the calcium indicator. And with the same electrode, a, we're depolarizing the cell and making it fire. So this is the pattern, the membrane potential as a function of time. And these are the famous action potentials. And they're regular because we're injecting current, we're making the cell fire. And simultaneously, we're measuring calcium in the sum of the cell. And every time there's an action potential, there's a little increase in the calcium concentration. And when you fail to generate an action potential, you fail to generate that increase. So that means you can use this calcium trace and back calculate the pattern of spiking. Okay. And the reason this happens is because neurons, like every cell, have calcium channels on their surface. And when the neuron, and the neuron has essentially zero calcium inside, a very low concentration of calcium, and when the neuron fires an action potential, calcium channel open, and this lets in enough ions, calcium ions, to increase the calcium concentration significantly inside the cell, and you can read this out optically if you have a good calcium indicator. Okay, so through this, um, I would say, uh, consequence of the neuronal biophysics, that first of all, that we're lucky that every neuron has calcium channels in the surface, and second of all, that these calcium channels open with calcium with action potential. You can actually use calcium to read out the the uh, the action potential. And this is say, you could say, well, what's a big deal? In this cell, you can measure the act action potential with an electrode. But how about measuring that in all these 4,000 neurons? You cannot put 4,000 electrodes, but you can do this image is a, exactly a two-photon calcium image of a living brain slice. And in this type of experiment, we're monitoring at the same time the activity of 4,000 neurons. So this is equivalent of having 4,000 electrodes. So with this calcium imaging, two photon calcium imaging of circuit, it's not perfect yet, but at least we've solved the first problem of being able to monitor the activity of, if not the whole circuit, a big chunk of the circuit. Okay. So then we moved on we're still working on developing better techniques to image not calcium but voltage, but this is still very, uh, it's not working really. Um, but uh, with calcium, at least we can move on. And then uh, this is an example of the data that we've acquired with two photon calcium imaging. So this is the, the analyzed movie. Here you're looking at about 500 neurons. The, the, the neurons in gray are the cell bodies of the cells that are not firing. And the ones in red are the ones that are firing. And this is the spontaneous activity present in a brain slice as an example of uh, what I mean by imaging the activity of a circuit. So you should be able to make movies like this of big chunks of, of brain tissue, if possible, of the entire brain of an animal, and being able to capture the activity of every neuron and detect every action potential. Okay. Yeah. This movie was uh, 50 milliseconds per frame which is too slow if you want to catch a reaction potential, but we're improving the method and some of the things I'll discuss could actually help us get to the regime where we could actually monitor this with one kilohertz uh, uh, frame rate. So let me move on from the imaging to the how do we turn things on, okay? So uh, there, again, and we have to do this with two photon excitation. People have been using optogenetics, using genetic constructs that are turned on by light that may depolarize the neuron. Um, but as of today, they work very poorly with two photon excitation. So that means that they have been used only with traditional light sources like LEDs or lasers like this one. But this, as they penetrate the tissue, they scatter um, and then the spatial resolution essentially becomes uh, enormous. So they don't have the precision that we require for the analysis of the circuit. So what we've done instead is using uh, chemistry. Uh, in fact, uh, we use uh, the solution came from ruthenium, which sits in the metal, transition metal that sits in the middle of the periodic table, that uh, people uh, that are building solar cells 
have been working with ruthenium because it has ideal optical properties. You can build uh, antennas with ruthenium at the core uh, that are extremely efficient at gathering light. Uh, and one of these chemists is an Argentinian, a Chenique, and he was visiting my lab and he was saying, well, we have these great uh, ruthenium compounds. The problem is that when the sunlight hits them, they break apart. So they're terrible for uh, solar cells. Um, but uh, that, what, that would make them ideal to do photochemistry and photo release. So there are actually technical reasons why ruthenium is better than all the other metals, metals at this. No? Um, I will not go into, into the technical reasons, but let me point out that uh, with a collaboration with Echenique in Buenos Aires, we've built a series of ruthenium cage compounds in which you have ruthenium coupled with two bipyridines and a phosphine. And then with the remaining bond, we can um, derivatize it with a neurotransmitter, with excitatory transmitters like glutamate, inhibitory transmitter like GABA, or with neuromodulators, uh, nicotine, serotonin, dopamine, all kinds of things. And then when, uh, when we shine light, so these this cage compounds are inactive. So if you put glutamate here next to ruthenium, this glutamate will not bind to the receptors, will not activate the cell. But if you shine light uh, through these, these properties that ruthenium complex has, uh, the metal bond will break, releasing the transmitter. In this photo release, in fact, uh, it's extremely fast. It, this is a measurement of the photo release of ruthenium. It happens in about 14 nanoseconds. It's two orders of magnitude faster than traditional cage compounds that use an organic uh, moiety here, not normally based on nitrobenzyl chemistry. So because we're using a metal bond, one of the properties it has is that extremely clean and very fast on caging. So we've built this series of tools that are photo uh, activatable that break apart very quickly. And you can also excite them in a wide variety of wavelengths. This is the excitation profile of some of these ruthenium compounds. And they work in the, in the visible light. In fact, we've done uncaging of uh, uh, ruthenium compounds with lasers uh, like this one, with just uh, laser pointers. And they're strong enough to fire neurons when we uncage uh, ruby glutamate, for example. But they also work in the two photon regime. And this is exactly what we need them for. OK, so using this chemistry that, again, came from the people that were building solar cells, Okay, inorganic uh, chemists. We uh, we help bring it into neuroscience to solve this technical issue of how being able to turn cells on with light. And the way we did it is by building ruby glutamate, ruthenium bipyridine glutamate, in which you have a glutamate uh, molecule, you can photo release with light, and when you uncage uh, ruby glutamate on top of a neuron, you make it fire. Okay these currents that are generated are blocked by glutamate receptor antagonists. So they are, res they are due to activation of glutamate receptor. They're not due to photo damage or something else. And they also reverse at the reversal potential for glutamate. So this is a veritable clean glutamatergic activation of a neuron. Um, so using this ruby glutamate, we can actually uh, do these uh, experiments. For instance, in this case, we have two neurons literally next to each other. We're monitoring them. We have two electrodes to monitor their action potentials. And then we're uncaging on top of one, and nothing happens to the other one. Uh, you're uncaging in the second one, nothing happens to the first one. So this is, I mean, look at the special resolution that we have for this. This is exquisite. Even neurons that are next to each other, you'll be able, you won't be able to turn one on and then the other without mixing. So this is the type of tool that we need to do this circuit. Uh, uh, taking apart the circuit. And then, of course, we can go inside a cell and we can turn on not just a single neuron, a, a little piece of a neuron, these dendritic spines that are illustrated here. Uh, and this, the spatial resolution here is even smaller. This is about uh, half a micron or so. No? So you have literally sub-micron resolution in terms of the uncaging of uh, ruthenium, of uh, ruby glutamate in this case. So this is an example of um, two photon uncaging to fire this neuron. This is the special resolution I was talking about. We're patching this cell, and when we uncage uh, ruthenium ruby glutamate on top of this cell, we make it fire. If we move the laser a little bit off, 
then there's essentially no response of the neuron. We have single cell precision. So uh, an example of what you can do with this type of technique. Uh, so then you, have, you can have a brain slice and you patch one particular neuron. Can you record the membrane potential in this cell? And then you incubate this slice with Ruby glutamate. And you go in with your two-photon laser and you go and turn on every neuron in the slice one by one. And if this neuron that you're activating is connected to the neuron that you're recording from, you will detect a response. Okay? And doing this simple experiment serially, in about 10 minutes, we can actually test 500 neurons and find out if they're connected to the neuron we're recording from. So going back to Crick's dream, this is actually one version of Crick's dream. And it's not exactly what he had in mind, but we, we can solve the problem of mapping circuits we can go in an image like this, patch a cell, and stimulate all the other cells to see who's connected to that neuron. Uh, and to do this efficiently, we first, uh, we do this automatically. Okay, we cannot do this by hand, it takes too, too much time. So we first detect the contours of the neurons using an algorithm that analyzes the image and looks for these contours, and this happens in a couple of seconds. And then uh, we actually compute the traveling salesman problem to move the laser beam from neuron to neuron to figure out the fastest route to stimulate them all, one by one. And then we use this trajectory and essentially stimulate every cell and build maps like this one. So this is now a map of the connectivity of a piece of the brain slice. And we're mapping all the connection to this particular neuron. This is the neuron that we patch with the electrode. And the neurons in gray are the ones that are not connected. The neurons in color are the ones that are connected. And the color code corresponds to the strength of the connection. So these neurons up here in red are very strongly connected to the neuron in black. So this is an example of using these optical methods to decipher the circuit using two photon ion caging of this uh, glutamate in this case to be able to quickly, this map was obtained in about uh, 10 minutes, to map all the connections that are present in that uh, from this piece of, of the brain to this particular neuron. Okay. Of course, if you want to map the connection from all the neurons to all the neurons, it's another story. <laughs> but we're working on that too, not using electrodes, but trying to do it in an all optical method, as I'll tell you later. Is that a single plane? A this actually is a, only a 2D. This is a single plane, but we've done this in 3D too. Yeah. So, um, Yep. This is physically removed from the, the, the one plane is removed from the volume, right? This actually it's sort of in the middle of the brain slice. Okay. So it's it's sandwiched between this cut edge on the top and in the bottom. Yeah. Were there a lot of connections between neurons that were out of that plane that were removed? We don't know. But we presume they are. In fact, the connectivity increases as we go deeper into the slice. These slices incidentally are about three to four hundred micron thick. They have approximately 10 layers of neurons on top of each other, uh, and they extend, the slices extend for several millimeters. Okay. They have maybe 10,000 neurons, maybe 50,000 neurons, depending on how rough you estimates. Can see, you can see the connections within that slice. Exactly. So for that slice, we can, in principle, with two photon optics, we can stimulate every neuron. We haven't done it yet in vivo in the mouse. That's another challenge, but it's not impossible to think that you could do this also in vivo, patch a neuron in vivo and stimulate all the cells, not all the cells in the brain, but all the cells in a larger and larger territory and map out the connectivity. One of the things we're finding, as you can see here, is that the connectivity tends to be very local. And this is something people know and suspected from the way the axons are shaped, that most of the connection, this is actually something that could be really important in terms of deciphering the double helix of the brain that it is possible with dealing with a very, very local module where most of the connections are in, intrinsic, internal. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so I discussed imaging, how we turn things on. How do we turn things off? Well, we use the same ruthenium compounds, but now we couple it to GABA, which is the main inhibitory neurotransmitter in the brain, in the mammalian brain. 
and uh, it works the same way except in reverse. So now if you uncage Ruby GABA on top of a neuron, you generate these currents that reverse uh, the GABA reversal potential. They're blocked by GABA receptor antagonists. And we can use this to uh, map GABAergic receptors along a cell. So this is an example in which we're moving our two-photon laser up and down the cell, and we're mapping the GABAergic responses. So this gives you a little bit of a map of the heterogeneity of the function of these GABAergic receptors in the neuron. So this is something that you couldn't do before because you needed two photon precision to be able to map this uh, to this level. But of course, we're interested in using this to turn cells off. And this is an example of, of how we use Ruby GABA to turn neurons off. So let me explain this experiment. Um, so uh, let's look at this panel first. We're patching a neuron in a brain slice, and then we're uncaging Ruby GABA right next to it. The neuron is bathed in uh, the slice is bathed in Ruby GABA, and we're releasing it with our two-photon laser right next to it. And uh, in this neuron, we're making the neuron fire by injecting with the electrode a current that depolarizes the cell. And this is an example of the action potentials that are so current of the neuron every time we depolarize the cell. And in blue is what happens when we depolarize the neuron and uncage Ruby GABA at the same time. So we've silenced, you see, silenced the, uh, the neuron by uncaging GABA on top of it. And then if we move the laser beam a little bit to the left or to the right, then uh, we lose this uh, silencing effect. So in this case, 10 microns away, we still can silence the neuron, but 20 microns away, we cannot any longer. So this tells us that the precision we have at silencing is on the order of 10, 15 microns, okay? So this is just to illustrate that it's a two photon effect. Uh, this is the same type of panel in C. In C, the point spread function of the photon is much worse, so the spatial resolution is a little bit worse than it is in X, Y. So, um, so that means that you can actually optically silence neurons using with two photon lasers. <coughs> and um, we've used this uh, for different <coughs> experiments. One of them I wanted to illustrate here this is in collaboration with Steve Rothman at the University of Minnesota. Uh, and this is to use uh, Ruby GABA to stop epilepsy. So you know there's uh, uh, about a third of the patients with epilepsy do not respond to drugs, uh, and most of them have to go uh, to the surgeon. And as of today, it may seem brutal, but surgeons go in and scoop up pieces of the brain. That's the only solution for these patients. And maybe there's a method to use optics to help by uncaging GABA on the pieces of the cortex that are generating these seizures and stopping the seizures optically. And this is an experiment from an animal in which we, this is a mouse in which we've induced these seizures. This is the uh, electrographic uh, evidence for seizures in the mouse. And this has been induced using a pharmacological treatment that makes the mouse epileptic, this uh, 4AP model. And in a control uh, experiment uh, without uh, Ruby GABA, we turn on uh, blue light and nothing happens to the seizures. As it's, it's sh nothing should happen. But if we have Ruby GABA on top, topically applied to the brain and we turn on the blue light, we can actually stop the seizures. So in this case, we're actually, this is not a two photon job, this is a one photon job, but we're silencing seizures over a significant period of time in, a, in the poor, poor mouse. So this could be imagined as a potential therapy. Uh, Rothman is a neurologist is interested in developing this as a therapy for, for epilepsy. For, chronic epilepsy that doesn't respond to uh, pharmacological treatments. So uh, let me talk to you about the piano. And this is actually, those I think are the most fun experiments. So again, the idea is to be able to image all the cells and at the same time going with optics and turn cells on and off in any arbitrary spatial temporal fashion. And I think these experiments could actually lead us into the transfer function of the circuit. Um, so with tried to do this uh, with two photon uh, uncaging of glutamate uh, using a single two photon laser beam. And this is illustrated here. So this is an experiment in which we have 50 neurons in a brain slice and we're imaging calcium in the 50 cells by raster scanning the laser beam and monitoring the fluorescence. Okay. And this is illustrated here. This is the cell number as a function of time. And every time you see this little black uh, lines, 
is when the neuron fires an action potential. So this is, you're watching all the firing, a movie like the one that I showed you earlier, displayed now in a raster plot, in which you see every neuron and every spike. Now, in the middle of this experiment, with the same laser, we're going and uncaging glutamate in five neurons that are illustrated here by the five arrows. And we do this by quickly moving the laser from neuron to neuron and then back to imaging. So we're imaging all the cells, and in the middle, we're uncaging five, imaging all the cells, and then we move and uncage another five. And we're actually playing these musical scores, so to speak. We're walking our way through the circuit, turning on five neurons at a time. So this is illustrated here. So these green lines are the neurons that we're uncaging, we're firing. Simultaneously, we're imaging all the circuit, okay? But look what happens here. In whatever, 200 seconds into the experiment, we uncage these five neurons and boom, the circuit goes ballistic, they all fire, okay? And then we continue our march, boom, something interesting happens. And a little bit later, something interesting happens there. No? So we don't understand what's going on. <laughs> yeah. But something's going on. No? And you would agree that this is not like a random uh, experimental spike, and that we've done something to the circuit. So this is like uh, electro engineers, so you don't know what the circuit is doing, but you, you know you're dealing with some sort of uh, business here, no? some interesting uh, transfer function. So this experiment was very exciting. We published it in 2007, but we did this by moving the laser quickly. So it's a little bit like playing the piano with one finger. No? And uh, it wasn't satisfactory. So we thought about, well, what we really need to do is to play the piano with all the fingers there, no? with 20 fingers or 10 fingers at least, no? and be able to change the pattern in any, any way we want, stimulate every, any neuron in any order. So um, this is the type of experiment that we have in mind. Uh, we record a pattern of activity, first these three neuron fires. This is like the movie that I showed you earlier. This could have been frames of that movie, and this could be spontaneous activity or activity in response to some stimulus. And then uh, we could uh, generate patterns that resemble these patterns and see if we do this to the circuit, that the circuit complete the, the song. Okay. If we could do this experiment, we could actually test whether the circuit is built for pattern completion. This is one of the ideas that is floating around as what could this double helix of the brain be built for. Maybe it's some sort of pattern completion type of uh, circuit. Okay, so uh, again, so we have a fundamental problem with two photon microscopy because all the laser scanning microscopy is serial. You point a single laser to one point and then with galvanometers or AODs, you move it very quickly to scan all the sample. And that's just not, not going to cut it because the, you can move the laser as fast as you can, but the faster you move the laser, the smaller the dwell time per pixel, which means that if you want to get enough photons out of those pixels, you're going to have to increase the intensity, and this is going to lead to photo damage, and you're going to be saturating the chromophore. So we thought that the better solution was to split the laser beam into many beamlets using either diffractive optical elements or special light modulators that I don't have to introduce to this audience, okay? So we essentially uh, have explored this uh, multiplexing of the laser light as a solution for this problem of playing the piano with, uh, all, with 10 fingers. So um, I'm not going to discuss uh, the DOD, DOE, sorry. I'm going to focus on SLMs because I think they're much more powerful. And uh, as you know, they operate uh, essentially in the Fourier plane of light. And you could argue that mathematically, uh, they could mimic any optical transfer function. So at, the e at the end of the day, a microscope with all these components is nothing more than an optical transfer function. So you could mimic this with this SLM uh, in the Fourier uh, plane. Okay. So um, that enables us to shape the light in space and in time. And this is an example of the type of setup that we use. This is a femtosecond laser going through a bunch of optics, a pocket cell. And then uh, we run it into a Olympus modified uh, homemade um, two photo microscope. And then we detect the signals with uh, uh, PMTs. 
but in the middle of this we have the little module which where we have a reflective SLM where we can actually uh, split this pin into any uh, arbitrary set of pinlets and with two photon light uh, you can then take images uh, desire images like this one calculate the face mask and then essentially write Columbia with light in your sample with two photon light this is the Ramonica Hall I was talking to you earlier so people in my lab uh, it wasn't my idea but they decided to write uh, the picture of Ramonica Hall in the in the in the brain uh, and the way we do this as you probably do here is through these algorithms in which we we have a calculated uh, um, 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 ideal target and then we uh, essentially um, through a, 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 a series of loops we improve the face mask to match it until we obtain a really good match to the target uh, image that we want to to uh, to mimic no and um, so the idea is um, this can help us tremendously with our research program because uh, First of all, you can do, you can get around this serial problem of laser microscopy. Um, because you can take an image that you can obtain using traditional laser scanning slow uh, frame rates, and then you can calculate where the cells are, detect where the cells are, okay? Then calculate the center of mass of each cell, and this is done in a couple of seconds, and then upload these positions onto the SLM to generate the mask through this algorithm I, I quickly described and then you split the, 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 the beam into a series of beamlets that each of them target one of the neurons and then you can use a camera and simultaneously acquire the fluorescence from all the neurons at once and if you use a fast camera that runs at 100 hertz or a kilohertz then you can essentially read out with kilohertz uh, frame rate the activity of all these neurons that are getting illuminated continuously so you don't have to pay, pay a price uh, in the number of photons that you uh, collect by imaging fast. Okay, so you get around this fundamental problem of, of laser scanning microscopy. So let me show you uh, this at work. So in this case we're imaging, I think it was 50 neurons. Uh, in this case it was uh, less, whatever, 20 or so. And here, let me just point out this, this uh, we're running the camera at 16 milliseconds per frame. This is two photon images taken using this approach. So we split the laser beam and we've targeted each of the beamlets to each of the neurons and we're monitoring fluorescent versus time and in this particular neuron we, we have an electrode so we know what type of action potential is generating and these are the calcium signals that correspond to the action potential and in this case we are detecting single action potentials. So we're imaging single action potentials in this group of neurons at 60 mi uh, milliframes per second. So this can be done, we've done it uh, with 100 neurons now. Um, we could in principle do it with even with 1,000 neurons without uh, any significant uh, problem. So you could image 1,000 neurons at let's say 10, uh, 100 hertz and detect single action potential. So I think this, this actually can really help this, uh, this type of uh, research. So, uh, but with the SLM not only you can use it to speed the imaging, you can use it to play the piano. And this is an example of some of these experiments. In this case, we're uncaging glutamate on several dendritic spines at once. So in this case, the uncaging is done truly simultaneously. We're not moving the laser. We're computing the positions of the dendritic spines, generating the mask, and using that mask to flash the laser beamlets on top of them and releasing glutamate at once. And these are the electrical responses of the neuron when we do this. Now. So in this case, we're essentially uh, playing the dendritic spines with six fingers. In this case, it's, we're playing a chord, it's synchronous. In this case, we're actually using the SLM to generate a mask that looks just like the cell, okay? So we're uncaging glutamate on top of the cell, but only on top of the cell. So we're essentially playing the cell on top of each other. And that should make this type of optical experiments very uh, efficient because you, you can compute the structure of what you want to stimulate and use that shape to optically stimulate that structure. Um, let me show you a little bit more what you can do with SLM. So the SLMs are essentially holographic techniques. You can do this in 3D. And this is an example of uh, two-photon stimulation in 3D. 
So these are now two neurons that are sitting at different focal planes. In this case, we've actually projected the image in the same, uh, uh, in the same plane, but they're sitting at different focal planes. And we have one electrode in each of the neurons. Okay. And, uh, and then we have essentially, uh, again, um, a similar setup uh, with an SLM in the middle before, uh, before the, uh, the, the objective. And we're, with the SLM, we have a mask that stimulates the top cell or the bottom cell. Okay. And the results are actually shown here. So in this case, we're stimulating both cells at the same time, and they're both firing together. But now we're stimulating only the bottom cell or only the top cell. And look how there is essentially no crosstalk in the optical stimulation. So this is, I think, the, one of the first cases, maybe the first case, where people are doing optical stimulation in 3D. In this case, it's only two cells. It's a proof of principle. You could do this with many cells. Uh, we don't know how many, but probably uh, with our setup, we can probably play the piano with 20 fingers, fire 20 cells in a volume, uh, and generate uh, action potentials on them. No? So, um, so this is a little bit where we are. Um, because of the idea that with an SLM you can mimic practically any optical transfer function, we went ahead and built a little microscope that has a, a transmissive SLM, I'm sorry, a transmissive SLM uh, that's um, uh, essentially with a light source, which is a laser pointer, okay? Um, and then with a little dichroic and objective, we can put it on top of a sample and then have a little camera uh, to image the fluorescent coming from this, uh, this sample. And with this type of pocket scope, which is not smaller than my laptop, you can actually do this multi-site calcium imaging and stimulation of groups of neurons um, with single cell resolution. So a lot of what we need these big monster microscopes to do, we can do them with a little pocket scope that costs maybe $10,000 to build. So uh, maybe SLMs could be used to advance, to bring into the typical laboratories or into the field um, these advanced microscopic uh, techniques. Um, so just to summarize, I discussed with you um, our improvements in terms of using ruthenium compounds to uncage uh, glutamate, GABA, and then we've also done a bunch of other things. Um, and the advantage of these ruthenium uh, cage compounds is that they're, they're very fast, uh, they're clean chemically, they're of course uh, water soluble, they don't uh, damage the cells. Uh, you can use visible light or two photon light to turn them on, to uncage them, and they're very chemically versatile. And then I discuss uh, our use of scanless uh, laser microscopy for fast imaging and for this type of piano experiments, multi-site optical stimulation. In principle, you could do the same thing with optical inactivation. Uh, and uh, I would make the pitch that these SLMs are ultimate optics because they can mimic most optical transfer functions. I haven't shown it to you, but we can use SLMs actually when we get lazy instead of focusing by focusing the Mechanically, you can actually focus with the SLM in the software. So you have essentially a microscope that has, in principle, you could build with no moving parts. And you could do in software a lot of the things that are traditionally done in hardware. Um, so just like in the electronics industry, there's a translation to software of things that used to be done in hardware, maybe in the microscopy. Something like this could be happening in the future. We haven't shown this to you, but you can do aberration compensation, adaptive optics with the same exact SLMs, and you, you actually, you, probably very uh, doing this here much better than we are. Um, and uh, yeah, and maybe, maybe we could be uh, looking at the microscopy of the future. And finally, just the, the person that was responding for the work was Nikolenko, who's a phenomenal grad student who did most of what I presented. Elodie Finot was responsible for the work with Ruby glutamate and Emiliano Real with Ruby GABA. That Darcy Peterka joined the lab and he's now taking the lead in the SLM work and I think you've met Darcy when he was here last summer and our collaborators at Chenik in Buenos Aires is the inorganic chemist and Steve Rothman in Minnesota is the 
a neurologist, and this work was funded by the generosity of the National Institute of the NIH and the HHMI. Thank you. <laughs> actually the, the people in the lab, and we just moved to a new building at Columbia for interdisciplinary science. <laughs> anyway, yeah. Um, I was wondering, considering the diversity of neurons in the, in the cortex, uh, using your approaches, one can identify the synaptic partners for individual neurons. Yeah. Is there also a way to couple it to identify the identity yeah. of the population? So we, yeah, I didn't, ex I didn't go into this, but we do all these experiments on mice on purpose because with mouse genetics, you can precisely do what you said. There are thousands of mouse GFP lines in which different subpopulations of neurons are labeled with GFP because it's under control of different promoters. So in our lab, we have about 10 lines that we use for our experiments, and each line identifies a subtype of, of neuron. So we focus a lot of our work on the inhibitor neurons, the so-called interneurons, Gabergic interneurons. Uh, and for those, we, uh, we have these GFP mice. So uh, we're not mapping circuits at random. We're essentially going systematically through the main cell types. Uh, and uh, actually, the good news is that the circuit diagrams that we are obtaining for these interneurons, they look all identical. So that means that at least for the inhibitory cells in the, in the cortex, the reverse engineering of the circuit diagram is pretty much almost finished in terms of understanding their circuit uh, connectivity. No? The excitatory neurons are the, more, the bigger challenge because they represent about 80% of all the neurons. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, by strength of response, do you mean uh, is it a multi-step connectivity between two neurons, uh, or? Yeah, this is the connectivity between. Uh, yeah, in this case, is the connectivity. Let's say this this yellow cell between this yellow cell and this black cell. So this one is about whatever two millivolts. That connection is about two millivolts in amplitude, and the connection from the red cells is. Maybe five times bigger. Yes. So, so that, that's the strength of connectivity. But what does it mean in terms of silicon network? Does it mean the yellow cell is connected via, let's say, you know, four other neurons to? The no, no, no. Connection? This is direct connectivity. So we know for sure that these cells have axons that contact the dendrites of the black neuron. So this is the strength of the direct monosynaptic connection. So that means why is the red cell five times stronger? There's two possibilities, because maybe it's making five, time, five times more contacts, okay? Or maybe it's making the same number of contacts, but they're just five times stronger, okay? So all of these are direct connectivity. That's right, exactly. So I'm discussing mapping direct connections. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. So, uh, so um, to to do the brain slices um, with SLMs, uh, it would be good to have a little bit more power than what we normally have. We have about four watts with this uh, coherent um, ultra, whatever they call. Uh, so, if the we had pass after lasers that had that were more powerful, it would be ideal. If you want to go in vivo and do this type of mapping job and reverse engineering in the cortex in an, on an animal, to go through the entire six layers, uh, it would be good to have maybe twice or three times as, as powerful lasers that we have currently. So power is one, uh, one request. The, our lasers have about 130 femtosecond pulse width, um, which are good. Uh, maybe it would be better if they were shorter, but it's not a big deal. I think if we were operating with shorter pulse width, we would have other problems to deal with. Um, but in terms of wavelength, I think uh, a lot of this work we're doing with 800 nanometers. Um, I think um, if you go deeper into the red, the cortex becomes more and more transparent. There's a window of, of opportunity. So I would prefer to do some of this work at 1064, for instance. If you keep going into the red, then you start hitting uh, the absorption of water. So to do this in vivo, uh, 
my idea laser would be like a 1064, whatever, 10 watt or 20 watt or something like that. Uh, and then, so well. Yeah. So there, there's enough for the calcium indicators now come in all different colors, thanks to the work of Roger Chan and other pioneers that on, on whose shoulders we're standing. <laughs> and so that problem is almost effectively solved. There are not that many dyes in the infrared, but I think people are coming with them now. I think I saw the, the group in Russia that's coming out in Moscow with infrared uh, GFPs. Um, so that part uh, for the imaging, um, a more fundamental problem for the imaging is to be able to image voltage rather than calcium. I would rather image voltage so that I don't have to, I can put images like this in which instead of measuring the voltage with an electro, we measure the voltage optically. Because if we could do this, then we wouldn't be, we would be able to map all the connectivity between all the cells to all the other cells. Because then we wouldn't need any electro. Okay, that's a more fundamental problem. But um, yeah, in terms of the, uh, uh, this um, uncaging of ruthenium compounds, we're uncaging with 800 nanometers. Uh, I think the uncaging becomes less efficient if you move deeper into the red. So yeah, maybe to play the piano, it would be good to have maybe a laser, uh, two lasers, one to image, and maybe a 1064, or another laser to uncage at 800 or something like that. Topically, yeah. Is there any chance of being able to get the sort of intravenous? So when you're, yeah. you're looking in yeah. an in vivo mouse? Exactly, you know? yeah, that's right. So, so in the, with our collaborators, they essentially put them in the CSF. And I actually, I, at the beginning, I thought it was a crazy idea. I mean, I was discussing with Rothman, you want to put this in a patient? Do uh, you want to inject Ruby Gabba in a patient? I said, listen, the epileptics that are I I not responsive to pharmacological treatments, they walk around with cannulas in their CSFs already. So they have already, they're injecting into their CSF uh, some of these antipleptic drugs. So it's, uh, it's trivial to put in uh, Ruby Gala <laughs> in the entire brain <laughs> on the inside. <laughs> okay. so, so that part, uh, in, in this case, it's an, a mouse with an open skull, and he's putting it on the top and, or putting it um, in the CSF. No? Okay, and the second question, so the, you know, I'm sure you're familiar with this work out of Genelia Farms. We're using uh, SLM to improve point spread functions yep. deep in tissue. Yep. Is there a hope that you can combine these two things on yes. a reasonable time scale? Yes, absolutely. We we're sort of uh, we were discussing with uh, Petsix group using SLM for that purpose before they even started <laughs> working on that. So we, I take part of the credit for that work, even though we didn't <laughs> do it. Yeah. So it's absolutely. I mean, you in principle could do it all together in one software suit. You're able to just press the button and say, here, I want to optimize. And I saw some very nice work today of pulse shaping that could be done with SLMs on the fly to essentially optimize the delivery of light to different depths and say, well, not only are we going to be playing the piano, we're actually compensate while we're at it, we're going to compensate for the, for the uh, scattering of the tissue in 3D. And that may depend from animal to animal or from piece of the brain to piece of the brain. So the beauty of it, you could do it all calculated in software and solve all these problems at once. If you want to play a particular song, yep. with an SLM, <laughs> that, that means you need to generate a sequence. Hey, that's right. How, how much computational work is that? Well, so we're, we're doing a little bit of that. We have slow SLMs that are modulated at uh, 60 hertz or so. Uh, and the way we're doing it, we're actually building a series of movies or sequences offline and then we essentially upload that. Uh, and in those uh, sequences we have a series of imaging targets and then in the middle of that we have some sort of uncaging targets. Okay, so that part it's, it's not that complicated. You essentially, you know SLMs, the, the ones that we use are, are offshoot of the consumer in electronics industry. You know? So they use movie formats, they can bring, take in uh, uh, TIFF file, uh, sequence of TIFF files. So that's essentially what we're doing. How about to, to make the movie, though? To form the movie that you actually want to upload to the SLM? Yeah, so to decide which neurons to play? Yes. Yeah, so that, that we haven't really gotten very deep into this, 
but some of the ideas that we've discussed is using uh, compressive sensing that I've seen uh, discussed today. Um, so, because you may be able to get away, if, if you assume sparseness, if you assume that the circuit is sparsely connected, you may be able to get away by using uh, one of these compressive sensing strategies and without having to sample every possibility, but sampling playing the piano with five neurons at the same time and using a random assortment of those, you may be able to solve the matrix of connectivity. So if, if I were to do it tomorrow, I mean, we're still not there. We're still fighting these other battles. But if we were to do it tomorrow, I would suggest maybe that could be one, one interesting experiment, to use a compressive sensing strategy to design these patterns of movies to play the piano and see how far we get in terms of predicting the connectivity.